Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have a delightful guest today. I'm speaking with Tim Walter, the writer of the book Spirit and Earth. Tim Walter worked as a successful corporate video writer, director, and producer. However, in the early 2000s, his interest in the stressful, deadline-driven corporate world had started to wane because his life had radically changed perspective. The family had moved house in, in 1998 and discovered where they had lived contained a ghost. This personality was delightful, caring soul that the family spoke to using dowsing. She introduced him to the concept of earth energy, which eventually led him to establish a network of international house healers. These are highly sensitive people who help others communicating with the overseeing subtle energy fields of our existence. Once aligned with this simple ancient process of focused intention and positive heart resonance, we can ride the waves of great change. This book I found very fascinating because it covers the spirit of the earth and sacred spaces, something we've talked about on the channel. And there's some very interesting little details that we can get into and lots of wonderful stuff about sacred spaces and guardians and elementals. So I just couldn't wait to talk to Tim. Welcome to the Reality Revolution, Tim. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's great. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, Tim, um, let me know. Tell me a little bit uh, more about your story that I mentioned there. Uh, you, you were working in in corporate America, and then you had this house, this this house where a ghost visited you. Tell me more about that. Yeah, corporate corporate UK. I'm over here in the UK. Um, right. Oh, sorry about so, that. Yeah, that's all right. That's fine. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah. It it, it was actually. Um, Really, I mean, right from right, I won't go too far back, but right from my school days, I'd wanted to kind of get into filmmaking and film directing and television and all this sort of stuff. So I went to film school. And in uh, 83, I left there and went to a really glamorous job of becoming a T boy. Fantastic, excellent. <laughs> but I was in the film industry. Brilliant. And what I discovered was that it was an incredibly stressful space for me. I'm a, basically a card carrying introvert and working in a high pressure environment with a lot of people around that you're, you know, beholden to when you're at the lower end of the scale. It was just crazily stressful. I left there and I started to work in the corporate sector as a video producer, um, working as a, a writer, producer, running conferences and this sort of thing. So I'd kind of gone from the T-boy low end of the echelons up to the being in charge. But of course, what was happening then was I was getting stressed from the client and having to deliver. So what you're seeing is a, a picture that was just fundamentally somebody that was working like mad, earning a reasonable amount of money, you know, great, fine, lovely, being able to support the family and all of that, doing it because I felt that's what I had to do. And we were living in the southeast of England, um my wife and i and we had two young boys at the time eight and five years old and we were living in a fairly small house and we decided to move house to uh, a much larger property and a property that had far more space on the other side of the country so we went to the welsh borders and when we moved into there that's when we encountered the ghost the spirit of the lady um, that was living in the house uh, with us and she basically announced herself um, through some dowsers that we got in because we were having some strange things happening in the house. And we thought, well, there's something like, you know, we need to get somebody in to look at this. And some dowsers came in. Um, they discovered this lady and we had a conversation with her. Um, and I was witnessing these three ladies basically with their dowsing rods talking to nothing as far as I could see. But it also seemed the very natural thing to do it seemed the most natural thing in the world that this was happening although it's very bizarre at the time and this spirit announced herself uh as being there to protect us to look after the space to protect us from what she called dragon lines we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly i expect but she was present and what she said to us was through these ladies was, I just want to be part of the family. So <laughs> it was like, well, okay, all right. I think we could, you know, we can live with a ghost as part of the family. I've never <laughs> done that before, but okay, let's give this a go. And so um, uh, I, I basically learned to douse so that I could speak with her. And uh, she stayed with us more or less on and off for the next 15 years, the, all the time that we were in that house. Amazing. So 
how would it go about? Would you hear a voice in your head? Would you have something bump in the night? How would you communicate with this ghost? Well, what was happening to start with before we actually got those dowsers in to to help us sort of understand what was going on is there were there were various things that were happening around the house. It was a house that was in need of quite a lot of uh, decorating sort of renovation work. And there was a space out the back of the house that was was particularly uh, needy. Um, and it was being used as a storage space by the previous owners. And we, you know, it was it was terrible. I mean, it was awful the, the neighborhood cats would come in and crap in there. And, you know, it was just dreadful. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so, so the house was in general need of work, but we would get the light bulbs flickering on and off and the television would come on and off. And even to the extent that we got a new TV and the guy that, um, I, I sent the TV off to be repaired first of all. And the guy looked at it and he said, he phoned me up and he said, what the hell have you done with this TV? The chip's fried. What, what have you been doing with it? It's like, well, I haven't been doing anything. It just goes on and off. But we got a new TV and then that, that one started going on and off. And this sort of thing was happening in the external environment. Very small little things, you know. But what was happening for me personally was that I was starting to see things, figures, shadowy figures, uh, dark figures out the corner of my eye, peripheral vision moving through as i was walking around the house i was seeing these these shapes moving and i was kind of putting it down to imagination and then one day i was in the kitchen and i was just making a cup of tea i'm fond of a cup of tea and i put my hand out to pick my mug up and there was another arm literally it looking as solid as mine just the arm went out mimicking mine had a black sleeve on right next to mine and it was there for just the briefest of moments and then it went and i was like did I? So I, did I? And it was shortly after that, that we had uh, somebody in who said, um, basically, I think you need to get somebody in to spiritually clear your house. Lovely house, but I think it needs some work. So there was a collection of things. And that's when the ladies came in uh, because of that conversation uh, from that fellow who said, I think these people can help you. So, what happened then when we'd actually made contact with Jane, what what used to happen was that, uh, again, it sounds bizarre, Brian, it's, it's just such a silly we, little we thing. We love bizarre. So it's okay, all well, yeah, but it's really, really silly little thing. Because what what happened was that we had, uh, you know, standard electric cooker in the kitchen, and um, had an LED display on it, you know, clock timer. And you know how those things go off, they flash, don't they? When they've lost power and they come back on, they flash zero, zero, zero. Well, what was happening with this clock was that it would change time. And we had a friend round and he was like, oh, well, your clock's changed. So we'll change that back to the right time. There you go, that's better. Don't know why you hadn't done that before, Tim. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, oh, your clock's changed again. Oh, I'm gonna fix that again. So off he went and changed it again, put it back again. And, and he was like, this is a bit odd, isn't it? How can that change time? It's an LED. Why should it be doing that? So by that time, I got, you know, used to dousing. And so basically, I asked Jane, I said, what's going on with the clock? And she said, well, I want to talk to you. So if you, if the ch clock changes, and it tells the wrong time, can you come and, uh, you know, come and have a chat? Because it's my way. And that was her way of making contact with us that's the that was the agreed agreed process so you know whenever the clock changed and it was out you know wrong telling the wrong time i would wander through to that dreadful room that we were starting to then work on and basically pick up the dousing rods and start to have those conversations with her and uh, my my wife and i would quite often on a sunday morning it just happened to be a sunday morning but we would quite often go down there and both talk with her um, and my wife doused as well at the same time. She's, you know, as sensitive as, as anybody is. And yeah, we used to have those chats about life, death and the universe and sacred sites and earth energy and all of that sort of stuff. Amazing. So uh, you mentioned dousing and you also mentioned it throughout the book. It's a key component of what you do. So for people who don't understand, tell me more about how dowsing works, how you go about doing it and, and how it's helped you in discovering these things. D dowsing is um well a lot, most people know about dowsing uh, as being the thing like the old guy walking across a field with a 
with a fork, twi you know, a stick, yeah. and it and it bends down or goes up when you come across water. So most people know it as a finding a way of finding water, but basically dowsing can be used um, in in uh, used for anything at all for finding anything that is not in the physical three dimensions. So it's a use for highlighting those things that your subtle senses are becoming aware of. So it's a way of opening up the intuition, and it's the to me it's the best possible way to start on this sort of spiritual path, if you like, if you want to use that word, um, to because it's so simple, although it, there are some pitfalls that you, you've got to kind of overcome as you start to learn dowsing. But dowsing is primarily, I won't, I won't do it particularly, but I've got a couple of rods here and, you know, you basically hold them and you ask for a yes response and you get a yes response, let them settle back to that and then ask for a no response and you'll get a no response. And that's the usual indication is that that's a negative, that's a no and that's a yes. But what I was doing with it, with dowsing, was obviously having that conversation with Jane, so with the disincarnate spirit. And so you'd have a conversation, you just hold the rods in that instance and you'd ask to speak to them and you'd get a response and then um, you just carry on having a conversation, connecting with them. And um, they're going to go over this way now. Yeah, because I was kind of half thinking about speaking to my guide. So it's like, oh, OK, they're going to show us where the guide is. Right. So it's over there. But basically you pick up a pair of rods and have a conversation and they'll confirm with you that you're you've got that connection and that you do what you're receiving and what you're picking up is fundamentally correct until they suddenly go like that or they stop responding. And that means you've basically dropped your connection. But that's in a nutshell what spiritual dowsing is, if you want to call it that. Tell me a story like one, one of the craziest things you've had happen when do, using spiritual dowsing. Uh, I think the, the, the it's not really crazy. It's just, um, <laughs> you know, and it's these wow, these wow moments are, you know, they're, they're interesting and they're fascinating, but it's not to me, they're not, they're, they're kind of like the signposts along the path. They're not really the, the essence of what the, the purpose of connecting is, but what it was really dramatic for me and was a really powerful, um, instance was where, um, I, what happened was that when we, when we found Jane and we, we started to learn more about earth energy and the nature of earth energy lines, some people call them ley lines. We'll talk about that if we have time. But um, uh, I'd talked to my father about the fact that all this was happening in my world. He thought I was potentially <laughs> having a nervous breakdown, but he, he kind of went with it. And he uh, mentioned to his sister that this was going on because he knew that she was interested in ley lines. And uh, my aunt sent a book by a guy called Hamish Miller. And Hamish Miller with Paul Broadhurst wrote a book called The Sun and the Serpent. And that is the story about their journey across the south of England in discovering what are now known as the Michael and Mary lines. OK, now I, t I tell you that as a way of setting up the fact that I met Hamish Miller when he published another book that he calls The Wee Book of Dowsing. I went along to his book launch and it was down in the far south of England. So it was a few hours drive. We you know, made a bit of an effort and it was lovely and to meet him but as i sort of, sort of stepped into his house i thought well oh, i know what i'll do i'll ask him if he wants to do any telly see if he wants to do some telly and i hadn't i hadn't planned it or anything so across this crowded room i kind of i went over to him and said Good, could you sign a copy of this book and and shook his hand and said are you interested in doing any television and he said uh oh, no oh, i've had some experience with television but um, can't really talk about it now drop me a line so I wrote to him and I got a letter back from him after a week or so. It was in the days pre-email, right? So this right. <laughs> letter, letter writing. So I got this letter and this letter was from Hamish Miller, this guy that I really wanted to work with because I, you know, he was a, a great figure in the dowsing world and he was, having met him briefly, just a lovely, lovely guy. And I could see the potential of what we could do for television in terms of, you know, this old fella, this old dowser working with the energies of the earth and this, you know, the idea of sacred sites and how dramatic that would be. So in this letter, he said, yes, uh, I've had, you know, had some experience with television. I think it's purely a, um, a medium that the, those in control use to control the masses. I don't think that it has a lot of value. 
However, uh, given your experiences, because I've told him about Jane and all of that lot, uh, given your experiences, I'm willing to give it a go. I'm willing to give it a try if you'd like to you know, call me and we'll set up a meeting. Now, so that was brilliant, right? So this was, so I was like, I was so overjoyed by having this, this letter from him. But there was nobody home. There was nobody home that I could share the news with. So I went into the, Jane's room. I know this is a very long-winded story. No, I, I love get, it, yeah. Get, get into the point. I went into Jane's room because by that time, you know, it was like, yeah, we're just on chatty terms, so it's fine. So I picked up my dousing rods. And I sat on the other side of the table where she she quite often sat, we actually had put a chair out for her and it was all of that. And it was a really nice room up, up the, above the depressing room, right? So I was sitting there and I had this letter from Hamish Miller. And I, I said to her, this space, I just said to her, you know, this is so this is so lovely. This is so important. This is so significant. This is this is wonderful. And I, I was kind of like getting a bit emotional about it. And I just said, I, I love you, Jane, because I did. I genuinely felt love. And what happened was that a breeze, a physical breeze came up through the room. It came from that direction where she was. It came right across the room, literally, you know, making curtains, you know, drift a little, came over me like a wave. But that was love. It was pure love. It was the energy of love coming back from her. And that was unbelievable. It took my breath away. It literally was like being submerged in love. It was it was unbelievable. And what that did was it proved to me, although it didn't kind of sink in logically at the time, I just was like, well, oh, that's amazing. What's going on? Uh, but it proved to me that this dim dimension that we live in is built on the on the real solid basis of love and that love is a powerful powerful energy in its very pure form amazing now to speak a little bit about the books spirited earth uh you kind of start with a very powerful premise which i agree that the earth is living it's a living breathing thing that we're we're walking upon and as a result uh, we have these amazing interactions in the world. People do not realize that all around them is this unseen world that that we we can access. Y you you mentioned a whole bunch of very interesting things. I was fascinated by the mention of elementals and how they can interact with you. And and so, tell me for for those who don't know if if they want to interact with an elemental, what it is and how we can interact with them. Yeah, I mean, elementals are fundamentally nature spirits. So um, over there in the States, I think you're more familiar with the idea of nature spirits than uh, elementals as such. But what we're really talking about there in terms of earth elementals, for example, is the little people, is fairies um, and any of those sort of earth based uh, beings that are connected intimately in the subtle realm to the, the life of the planet in its natural sense, in the fauna and the fabric, uh, you know, the plant life, right? So, so if you go to a, if you go to any wild, wild space, uh, because unfortunately they're sadly lacking, certainly the earth elementals are sadly lacking in, in urban areas. Um, although, you know, there are air elementals and fire elementals and water elementals, of course, which are all there and present, but earth elementals in the urban spaces are sadly lacking. But anyway, if you go to a wild, a more natural space, a space where there is that the, the energies are allowed to just do what they want to do, then if you're basically open enough to to just feel the space and to be present in the space, you know, it's you'll know, Brian, you'll know understand this precisely and, you, and a lot of your viewers will get it straight away is that you know you've got to be in that still space you've got to allow yourself to just click in to that part of you that can connect to any of the subtleties of a landscape and it's no good at all in just thinking that you can step out of a car and step into a space and immediately connect you've got to allow it to settle and allow it to become to become aware of your presence but once you do that, then if you're interested, if your heart is open to the idea of different beings, different elemental beings, different nature beings of any sort, whether they be, like I say, water, air, earth, air, fire, 
but the the easiest ones that I find to connect to are the earth elementals. So the the little kind of fairy type elementals um, or gnomes or dwarves, any of those sort of aspects. If you are open to the idea, then if there are any there and they are present, then they will come to you. You will feel them. There's a very childlike energy about a sort of a presence of that kind of being. The problem is that they are also very suspicious as far as in my experience, my in my reality, they are very suspicious of human beings because the way that I understand it, we used to be intimately connected to them and would be kind of looking after the earth in harmony with them. But what's happened is that we've just completely shunned, you know, shunned them, shut them down, kept them out in most cases. You know, the vast majority of the human species does, probably not most of your viewers, but, um, you know, in shunning them, we have made them suspicious of us. So they have to take, a, they, they can take a little while to kind of warm up. Uh, it's a bit like any kind of um, dog or cat in a way. Some of them will be more, you know, more willing to be uh, with you um, than others. But yeah, they, 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 they are delightful. My, my sensitivities, I'm not, um, I'm not overly sensitive. Uh, you know, I'm not like some people, some of the people that I've worked with, um, and taught them house healing and, and all sorts of things. They've been so sensitive that they can walk into a space and they will literally, you know, just see these beings as clear as anything. I don't see them like that. I, I get a, um, an impression of a feeling and I get a kind of a feeling inside about what's going on. And I use dowsing as a way to kind of verify, well, you know, what have we got going on here? What is happening in this space? So that, that's why I kind of stick with dowsing because I'm not, because I ain't that sensitive. Yeah, I, I get that. So th there's, there's, you have different kinds of elementals that you mentioned, and you, you had mentioned the earth elemental. You can also, um, you can also access the fire elemental. Tell us a little bit about the differences between those elementals. Well, they're, they're you know, they're going to be uh, automatically associated with the different uh, aspects in our three dimensions. So a fire elemental is going to be associated with fire. Uh, you know, you've got a candle or a, or an open fire. You're going to the likelihood is that you're going to get a salamander or something or uh, other kind of being associated with that fire, um, especially if you're doing a, a, a little fire outside, you know, of an evening. It, uh, it's great fun to be um, mm -hmm. playing. Uh, you just need to be a little bit careful of fire elementals because by their nature, they are fiery. Um, and I mean that not in the physical sense of setting fire to things. I mean, they are when they if they want to get playful, then they can be a bit they can they can get out of control. So you need to be a little bit careful with fire elementals, but uh, all of the others, um, so water elementals, so you've got dryads in streams, um, that's just beautiful to connect to that feeling, which is a very, uh, can be a very gentle feeling, but equally they can again erupt into, you know, uh, floods and the, in that case you get a very different feeling from them kind of lost track of what your question was it was difference between the different types wasn't it yeah yeah so we, we covered the the fire elementals the water and the earth and tell me a little bit more about the air elementals yeah well ah yeah now uh, air elementals are fantastic because they you can get you can get amazing uh beings and um, I'm pausing because I'm thinking about a time when I stepped out of the back door in our old house and just looked up at the sky and it was just there was it was clearly a weather front coming through but it the shape of the clouds it was just it was just a it was a cosmic being I mean it was extraordinary mm -hmm. the the impact of it was just like oh my god and it was just huge and it was just like a being with outstretched arm, you know outstretched arms flying across the sky but so they're beautiful. Um, but then, you know, the, the little kind of sprites that you can get with, I mean, in a way associated with that sort of feeling of love, that story that I was saying about love, that, mm -hmm. that breeze coming through a room, you can almost get that sort of effect created by a, by a sprite, but they tend to be more wafting than, than that wave effect that I had. But they are, you know, they're all there to be communicated with and there and they will um enhance your life if you want to see the world like that um from a house healing point of view sometimes they 
elementals can be a bit uh, mischievous and they or they get lost they can get stuck in a house and so in that instance they can start to cause a little bit of uh, a little bit of problem for the home owner and they need to be taken out and put back in their natural environment you know you so say you can get water um, uh, dryads or that sort of aspect st stuck in central heating pipes for example so what happens then is that the, you get a really damned awkward heating system um, but you can clear it asking upstairs asking the management upstairs to help clear it and shift that elemental back out and put it where it should be so my question is can elementals follow you i i was convinced sure, yeah. for, for a long time that i had water elementals that were following me and i would experience the, these little things in different houses um uh, you know um you know there would be mold that would form a, a water leak would form and it would always be in the different places and i was convinced there's something supernatural going on that this is there's some level of consciousness with this and i finally decided to talk to it and, right. and like 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 I, I appreciate you and i thank you you know there's um, you're causing a little bit of problems with me and and i felt like there was an interchange that happened Does yeah that makes yeah. sense right that's, yeah 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 exactly that's 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 <laughs> that's exactly what can happen i mean very often for example people that work in the land people like farmers they'll go back home and they'll be they'll have you know it's like well the image that i saw once was it's like they're having they've got elementals hanging off them because they 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 will follow you but also you can have a, like an instance that you described there where you've got water elementals and yeah yeah sure i mean that's that's you know, there's nothing that's a, a completely with you there, Brian. You that's what happened for you, right? But equally, sometimes you can get elemental activity like that because the management wants to be giving you a different sort of message. So it's not even necessarily that it's about the elementals themselves talking to you, it's just that the management is using the elementals to say, Brian, you got to pay attention to this. Come on, Come, you know. Right. And so it's about then, it's about asking the questions that you are drawn to ask and open, you know, and what, what do you open up to? You have a chapter that's dedicated to crystals. And I have a lot of people in my group that are quite fascinated and use crystals all the time. So tell me about your experience with crystals and how we can use them and what the different kinds are and, and how you integrate it into your work. So I'm not a great crystal expert, um, uh, but the way that I, tend to use crystals because I know some people are absolutely fascinated by them and some people absolutely love them and and really look into all of the kind of classified uses for them. The way that I tend to work with them um, and, and it's kind of what we're suggesting in the book is that actually a lot of the classification of crystals you needn't necessarily go with the classification that is given you know if you get the the bible of crystals it's fine it's perfectly valid and lovely and brilliant and useful if you want to use it in the way that it's outlined in the book but you don't have to so i don't tend to follow any kind of strict protocol in saying right well this rose quartz is specifically for xyz or this you know bit of whatever it may be and amethyst is for specifically xyz um so I tend to use crystals. I I sometimes use crystals when I'm I want to demark the space that I'm working. When I'm working on a house, I will use crystals not so much for the healing aspect, but to actually just demark the space that I feel I want to create. Um, I don't usually do the dousing work now in in the office. I'm lucky enough to have another space beneath this that I I tend to do the the dousing in. Um, but I tend to use them for that. So I use hematite or something like that to kind of lay out um, the space. S but some house healers will um, specifically allocate different types of crystal for their individual clients. So they would suggest different crystals that would go in different rooms once they've doused the floor plan and once they've discovered what is affecting the person. Um, and so that's a very unique exercise because it's bespoke to the individual. And what we have to bear in mind is that all of this work is done on the principle that we are energy beings, which you completely understand, but that we inhabit our own complete and utter unique universe. So at the moment, your universe is, is, is interacting with my universe, but the laws of my universe are not the same necessarily as the laws of your universe. There are nuances and aspects that are completely different. And 
it's really just another way of saying that we're we're on slightly different vibrations but at the moment we're sharing those vibrations coming back to crystals I attend to, you see, this is the thing is that if somebody is really fascinated by crystals, then, then that's great because they will follow their path and follow their heart. But crystals, like anything else, can be programmed with the intention. And so, you know, that, that's part of the beauty of crystals is that they are so programmable. So that in a way, I, I kind of fly in the face of what is generally accepted to be practice. By again, by the fact that I don't necessarily follow the strict regimented uses for each individual crystals. So um, I'm not your crystal e expert, Brian. Yeah, but if, if I want to program a crystal, what technique do you use? Sim simply intent. I mean, all of mm -hmm. this work is intent. I mean, everything, as far as I'm concerned, our entire reality is built upon the intention and the um, expectation, if you like, of what our creative energy inside is doing moment to moment. So when we want to really actively connect in that healing sort of modality, then it is the intention and the, the process of making that connection with upstairs. So in other, it's kind of like the way I describe it is, getting closer and closer to the higher self. So we, we shift our perception up that kind of scale of, you know, let's get closer to the higher self, because that's when we're at the higher vibration, and we're able to actually be more receptive and communicative with the management upstairs. And it's the management upstairs that's doing the healing work when we're talking about healing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about simply reprogramming a crystal, then we're doing it literally with the with the with the heart energy associated with upstairs and in the belief that this will make a difference and make a change to the programming of this crystal, which of course it does if you believe it 100%. So 100% power of intention is one of the building blocks of our reality, as I'm sure you realize. So you dedicate a lot of the book to sacred spaces, sacred spaces and, and places and also creating your own sacred spaces. So I, before we go, I, I wanted to recommend an out of print book that I, I know that you would love after reading your book. The, 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 uh, the Secret Power of the Pyramids by U.S. Anderson, who originally wrote Three Magic Worlds Words. It's a, it's a travel log. It's a first-person travel log written in the 60s where he goes around to these sacred spaces and talks about the experience that he has. And like you say, there's guardians at these places. There's magical experiences. You move into higher realms of consciousness. And so there's a movement of people that are just, regularly every weekend we're going to go to a sacred space they have this experience where they go to a, a sacred space and it's so powerful that it becomes addicting like a drug yeah yeah uh, and 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 i i've um now the other thing is uh, you know moving into my house i felt like this is a sacred space and the more i was meditating and using it it became even more and more sacred um so I, i'm very fascinated by this uh, tell me a, a little bit about why this was part of the book and, and, and the power of sacred spaces. Let's, we, I'd love to talk yeah. about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's, it, it, is, it is really fascinating because actually it also reflects something about the nature of what we are and the nature of where we are. Because uh, I made a, the, the first video I made with Hamish Miller, the guy that I mentioned earlier on, right, mm -hmm. the guy that, that did the dousing across the south of England. Um, we made a video together uh, called this, <laughs> I can't even remember what it was called. 2003, we made it. It was the Spirit of the Serpent. Yeah, Spirit of the Serpent. Um, don't know why I have trouble remembering that. It's ridiculous. Really, it's, it's, it was a 30 minute pilot for broadcast TV. That's fundamentally what it was. So we filmed at uh, a Neolithic sacred site down in Cornwall, um, a site in the UK called the Merry Maidens. So if you can picture the, a standard stone circle, you know, everybody knows what they're like. Can't remember how many stones, probably 20 or so, 24 maybe, I can't remember. But anyway, all of these lovely stones put up in 4000 BC, something like that. Now, you can enter that circle and just wander in and look at the stones and think, oh, this is nice. And it's, it's in quite a nice location, you know, look across the fields and you can see the sea in the distance, you know, 
and watch the sun go down or the sun come up and you can walk out and not experience anything. Or you can go into that circle, respecting that it is sacred, understanding that you're going into a special space, gearing yourself for that uh, experience, being open hearted, and it will blow your socks off because it's just a, it just takes you into that altered state of consciousness. That again is all about intention. And what it illustrates is how actually, even in our day to day life, we can set our intention to ex have an experience that is wonderful and positive, or, you know, we can, we can, or we can just go through day to day life uh, with all of the monkey chatter going on and wallow in our own low energy vibration and just, dah, it's just another day and everything gets on top of you and all of that stuff. It's all about choice. It's all about that mindful decision making. It's all about fundamentally, where does your heart sit? How open is your heart and where, how aligned are you with that vibration of love and compassion? Because that is, of course, what changes the entire uh, experience of being alive. As a sacred site, a home is effectively a sacred site because it is your place of refuge, it is your place, it is reflecting you. It is the, the, the uh, external environment that you cherish and love, hopefully, um, and it will reflect you and it will protect you as well. And there are guardian energies there that will also protect you and you can speak with as well, but that's another point. There are all sorts of influences in the subtle realms that will play on you as a, as a human being and as a subtle energy being yourself uh, in any given environment. And what we quite often find is if somebody's going through a, you know, if somebody's on a spiritual journey, then they will quite often at some point as they kind of shift a level for whatever reason, they will usually move house anyway. So the house changes because it's part of the picture of the energy that the creative process inside the person is presenting and interacting with. So a house can be regarded as a sacred site in as much as a, a stone circle can be. The thing is that what happens is with a sacred site stone circle is that fundamentally, because it was set up as a sacred site and recognized as a place of, for ceremony, the energy of people using it has gone into that space and the purpose of that space is for altered states of consciousness is for spiritual connection. So if you think about something that's been in existence for thousands of years, it's had time and time and time and time again, the same energy of ceremony intention going into that space into the etheric energy that is there holding the space together. And that's what it absorbs. That's what it reflects back is that intention. So an official sacred site will, will always be more powerful than the sacredness of your home. But the same fundamental elements are in your home as they are in the sacred site. Everybody gets carried away about the sort of like, oh, there's a fantastic vortex in this sacred site, this Neolithic site. Well, yeah, there is, but there's also a fantastic vortex there are many vortices throughout your home as well. And you and wherever you meditate, Brian, you will be sitting right next to a really positive vortex, an earth energy vortex that will be just as powerful and are capable of taking you into an altered state of consciousness as one that you could experience at a sacred site because you're, you know what you're doing and your intention and your heartfelt intention when you connect to it will enable that process to work. Tell me that what's the most powerful sacred space that you've ever encountered? Well, a definition of powerful, you know, I mean, uh, I, I went up to um, Glastonbury Tor, uh, which is a, you know, famous landmark. And I think every, everybody will probably will have seen photographs of it. It's a fantastic uh, outcrop of, uh, you know, very hillock with a single sort of turret on it at the moment it's where a church was demolished but there is a, a vortex just the the far side as you walk up it there's a the standard route up and you just go the other side and basically i stepped onto this without realizing and i i was up i was up in the god straight away i was like oh my god just <laughs> you know it's like my i was yeah it was ridiculous 
So that was the most dramatic in terms of, well, my awareness was just powered out from, yeah, way up. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, Merry Maidens, all of those stone circles down in Cornwall, the, the experiences that you, that you can have, they, they are all very powerful. Um, what, what you'll find is that, again, using dowsing, you can communicate with the guardian energy of the site. And that makes a huge difference. If you can uh, basically approach the site and ask permission and ask if you may enter, and you will get a response, you'll get a very strong response, everybody will, with their dowsing rods, right? So you get a yes, and then normally 95% of the time, maybe more, you'll be allowed in. Don't get hung up if they say no, just ask, can I come in in five minutes, right? And there might be some bizarre reason why they don't want you in right at that moment, but don't get hung up about it. You're not be, they're not being personal, they're not throwing you out. Anyway, if you can connect to that guardian energy, then you are instantly in a, in a process where you can ask questions and you can feel things more strongly because the guardian energy is communicating with you and, and is kind of, mag kind of magnifying the effect for you. So, and again, this really depends on the way that you as an individual are open to connecting to these energies. Most guardian energies are very um, uh, open to that kind of exchange. Where was I going with this? Um, oh, so the, the, the stone circles in Cornwall, when I was doing the recce with Hamish, uh, the recce for, the, the, for, for shooting, trying to decide which one we were going to use to, to shoot in, to film in, we, we spent a day going around the different circles. And on that day, um, as I approached each and every one of these six circles that we went to, it, as I approached each one of them, I could hear audibly, just like in the real world, wave upon wave of primarily male voices saying welcome so even even before we entered the space right so there was this wave of welcome welcome many many voices welcome and i was like well this is great um and i i went to one which was the hurlers and these voices of welcome they said welcome back and i'd never been there before i had never been there before and it was like, oh, do you have a welcome back, welcome back, but I'd never been there. And uh, I spent about an hour or so there with Hamish and there's a, a, a pile of uh, massive um, balanced stones. It's, a, it's supposed to be a geological formation. It probably is, but it doesn't look like it. Um, it's right next to the hurlers and it's known as the cheese ring. And it's sort of on, a, on an outlook um and i went up there with hamish and looked out across this land and do you know what i felt like i used to own this land you know like whoa, wow. a long long time ago and it was like oh that's why they say welcome back you know it, it that was extraordinary it really was a wow it was uh but it was also slightly egotistical as well i thought i own that <laughs> right well i i can't imagine so most of these sacred spaces, as you say, have a guardian and spirits that are there. Uh, and you and some even have angels that um that you mentioned. Um so uh, you, you you primarily connect with the guardian through the dowsing. Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, yeah, definitely hundred okay. percent. You're basically asking to speak to the guardian of the space. It's the guardian of the space that is the most approachable and most useful to talk to. Because if in, in any space, like in a space in a house, you've got you've got three guardian aspects. You've got the I'll come back to the guardian of the space in a minute, but you've got the, the spirit of the land. So that's that literally is the land. Which is really more connected to that kind of elemental energy that we talked about earlier mm -hmm. on. But it's the spirit, it's the genius loci. It's the you know, it's what oh, it's, this place feels great, but it's the spirit of the land. It's not a great thing to communicate with. It's it'll do its best, but it doesn't really know a lot about what's going on. Then you've got the spirit of the actual fabric of the house, right? So the actual fabric of the building, you can talk to that. You can talk to the house. You can ask a house about, you know, does it is there any work that needs doing on the roof? Is the windows doing okay? Is the doors okay? Oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you something about the nature of what it is. But the guardian of the space is what Jane was in our house. The guardian of the space is the guardian aspect of that this subtle realm that we that that permeates absolutely everything. So 
as you you will appreciate everything arises into material form from the quantum realm so it's all coming into existence through the quantum process and coming up in scales and, and materializing every moment and the guardian energy is is our equivalent in that space so we are supposed to be the guardians in this physical realm we're supposed to be looking after the space in this physical realm and the guardian energy of the space is the equivalent on the other side of the veil on that sort of quantum subtle realm they will talk to you um, as, for as long as you like, or just be with you. You know, you've run out. Of, you, ba you basically run out of questions to ask these beings. Um, so, but so don't ask the question. Just sit with them. Just be with them. Just acknowledge that they're there, and allow them to be present. But you can use dowsing to have that conversation in exactly the same way as I was describing earlier on. So you had mentioned ley lines and dragon lines, and so. Is it, that's primarily discovered through dowsing. Is there is there a resource where I can see the main ley lines on the earth and, and look in my area and look where, where the ley lines are crossing? Or is it something that's discovered intuitively? There, so ley lines are slightly different to earth energy lines. Earth energy lines are um, naturally created by the earth and the, the rotation of the earth. And they, they are broadly described as geomagnetic. Geomagnetic. Yes, geomagnetic which doesn't really mean very much because geo is just over the earth and magnetic is just like kind of part of you know electromagnetic right. but you know so it doesn't mean a lot but um but so but the, but the key thing is that they're natural formations and they weave like rivers ley lines are straight alignments so so it's not really about looking for the ley lines because ley lines are actually less significant than earth energy lines earth energy lines mm -hmm. are in, integral to the the mechanism of the creation of the reality that we experience because they connect us they they are the information carriers they connect us to source wherever source may be in the cosmos i have no idea but they're also of course go th they go through the vibrations they're not just in our vibration but <laughs> what was your question um about the ley lines, is there a way for us to identify where ah. these lines are beyond just dowsing? Can I can I look on a map, or do you, is there a resource where I can go and just search out, search out some of these main um, ley line and earth line and and dragon line areas? Is, there are lots there... of there are lots of dowsers um, that are actually doing a lot of work with earth energy um, simply because they're drawn to it. A lot a lot of us um, of this sort of generation are you know standing on the shoulders of people like Hamish Miller, the great dowsers that did the, the primary work to start with. There's a, a dowser in the UK called Rory Duff. Uh, you would find his work fascinating. He's actually mapping um, the big earth energy lines that circle the globe, that, that cross everything. And um, he is uh, undertaking a, uh, a project to actually map it so that it is available for people and that they um understand that where you get a crossing point of these lines that is major healing healing energy these are at very very significant sites the big nodal crossing points mm -hmm. now it's all very well to to do that and i've and i i love rory's work and it's brilliant that what he's doing is actually categorizing and bringing a very scientific approach to um to the exploration of earth energy, right? I think if you Google Rory Duff, you'll find it. And I think you'll find a website in answer directly to your question. But um, it, there aren't many websites that kind of highlight these things on a global scale. The thing that I wanted to say is that the part of the reason why this knowledge has been forgotten about is because it was held to be um, so important that it's not to be shared with the masses. So in other words, the church understood about earth energy. And because of the power of the church, they wanted to be in control of earth energy. Um, it's extremely likely that the Knights Templars also understood about the power of Earth energy, and therefore this is part of why we had the clash a few hundred years ago between the Knights Templars and the Church, uh, because the Knights Templars in their travels to uh, the, the Crusades had a lot of esoteric knowledge uh, that they gained from that part of the world. 
Now, what I'm really getting to is the fact that when the most important thing in any healing work is that you are completely 100% connected to your heart in genuine compassion. Because as we mentioned earlier on, what we're doing is perceiving the world differently as we change vibration. And if we're fundamentally accessing the energy of these lines and this network, which is the fabric of uh, the, you know, the fabric of, inf as I say, information carrying, which forms the, the reality that we all experience collectively. What you don't want to be doing is having a lot of people that actually are still on their own healing journey and therefore their vibration is quite mixed putting their opinion into the system because they mm -hmm. don't know what they're doing but the thing to bear in mind is that we are doing this all the time you know there's seven and a half billion souls of human beings on the planet seven and a half billion individuals are constantly inputting information emotional energy into that system all the time right so this is mm. part of the collective manifesting process it's it's a, it's a subconscious thing it's an automatic thing it's part of what we are but when we magnify that in a healing modality then really you want to be you want to be as aware of your own heart and of your vibration and of your own position in the bigger picture as you do that because otherwise all we're doing is pouring more crap into the system that's already overflowing with crap because we've been disconnected from our divine self mm -hmm. for so many centuries so really uh, what is wonderful about the book is it highlights that we are sort of an interface between the subtle realms and the physical realms and that we play a role a lot of people aren't aware of that and and, and so what a lot of what you've the information and knowledge that you have in the book you, you use to go and help other people heal their own houses you under you you, you discover energy fluctuations and, and different vibrational um, fluctuations in certain houses and you can heal them. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, the it, the, the house healing modality is, uh, you know, the name, the expression, the label house healing is not very well known. But actually what we're doing is, is you know, centuries old, it's eons old, it's not anything new. All, all of, what I've done is, um, okay, so I co-wrote the book, Spirit and Earth, with a good friend of mine, Adrian Inkledon Weber. Now, he published a couple of books about the house healing modality uh, called Heal Your Home. I'd recommend everybody goes out and buys those books as well, because what that does is shows you what to look for when you're dousing. And there are 50 or so section headings. And when I'm teaching the house healing modality now these days, I stick to 50 section headings and we're looking at right how are these adversely affecting the person that's come to us for for help right so so clients come to us and say look you know, my, i'm feeling very very stuck or you know i i bought this house i thought i liked it but actually i've never felt at home here what's wrong with it so we go through these 50 or so section headings and try to identify what it is that's adversely affecting what's holding them back what's interfering with them what what is causing them discomfort or dis-ease Again, we're using we're using the natural sensitivity of each house healer, the person, you know, everybody has a degree of sensitivity and it's something like dousing. All it takes is practice to build up your confidence and then you start to get the wows and the amazing experiences of understanding that actually you can connect to a property, you connect to a person on the other side of the world. And it's just part of the natural way that things are. So that's what we do is we identify what are the issues, we do it with dowsing, we work anywhere in the world. The Knights Rose Professional House Healing Network, which is a network of people that I've pulled together from the, those people that I've trained. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic little network because it's, it's actually full of uh, people that really understand the basic modality and have gone through a process of realizing that you know they're not 
they're not what they thought they were and that the world is not what it seems. And when we start to play with those two aspects and bring in the intention to heal, to help others, then things really start to get interesting. That is not to say that this path is an easy one. This is not fluffy. It's not something that is just picked up and played with and then put down again. It, we're talking about the very nature of being human. Sounds a bit heavy, but that's because that's my guide. Um, so um, he, he doesn't like it being mucked about with. It's not mucked mm. about with. It's, um, it's a serious pursuit um, because it's part of what we've been connected to. It's part of being human. But we have so long neglected it that we have really lost our way and this is the important thing and this is why I, I this is why i'm doing this work is because i want the idea that we can affect a space purely by intention by connecting to the management upstairs connecting to that spiritual aspect of self and express love into that space and help change something in that space right now that concept we uh, so many of us talk about that um and this is a way of really kind of proving it to individuals and they will then go out and do the work for other people and they will see it and experience it and, and get it and understand the importance of who they are and that's why i'm doing it it's like rather like the way i see it is it's like the early days of reiki you know when reiki started people would say what the hell is that what's that all about it's mumbo jumbo mm. nonsense you know um, but now, you know, everybody knows what Reiki is about and it's commonplace. And one day this house healing modality won't be seen as anything weird or strange. It will be part of what we're about as humanity. You know, that's where I'm going. That's what I'm hoping for. Super fascinating. So if people want to find you, the best place is, what's the website that the best place to find you? So you can either go to my website, which is www.knightsrose.com. That's mm -hmm. K-N-I-G-H-T-S-R-O-S-E. Or dig me out on YouTube. Uh, you know, put Tim Walter, Dowser, Tim Walter House Healer. Uh, that's W-A-L-T-E-R. And you will come up with my channel. Um, if you don't put the House Healer or the Dowser, you'll come up with some German football coach. And I don't think he really will help <laughs> with the with the answers so the book again is spirit and earth i definitely recommend there's lots of cool information uh, that I, I that you go through a lot of different stuff in that book and i and i found it very fascinating and i'll put the link in the description Correct. if uh so so i recommend everybody check that out thank you so much tim for for joining us and talking about your journey and, and opening us up, up to these subtle and unseen worlds that are before us all the time. And I'm excited to see that this sort of modality is growing because everywhere I go, uh, I believe that the world is shifting and I'm and 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 we are opening up to these unseen worlds. And some people aren't ready for it. I think it's time yes. for us to be aware that as we shift into this new level of consciousness on this planet, that we're gonna start seeing sprites and elementals and spirits mm. and guardians and it's just mm. going to be accepted it's it's it, right now maybe in 30 or 40 years mm. this is going to be an actually accepted thing on major news networks because it'll even become scientific i believe and i think that we're in this yeah. little transition phase where if you don't know about it it can be sort of frightening because people are not going to encounter these things and yeah. they're not going to know what's going on so books like yours kind of allow us to get ready for this new age that we're about to enter <laughs> yeah no, that's a great that's a great observation and i, I completely go along with that as well completely i think agree with everything you've said yeah i mean i think this time now if we were to compare like 50 years ago more and more people are going to become sensitive to what's going on in their house and their environment and the world around them yeah. they're going to have access to these things and it, because we 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 base a lot of what we have on the past, they're going to be like, "Well, I'm crazy," or "There's something wrong," mm -hmm. or "You know, I need to go to the doctor." It's not mm -hmm. true. This is something yeah. we've been talking about, and you're going to start seeing it. And you can refer to books uh, from Tim and Adrian that that can really help. So, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you, Brian. Fantastic. <laughs>